Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Sudeep Bose, a practicing attorney and Monero enthusiast who got his start in crypto as a Bitcoiner in 2013. A great conversation was had on the importance of Monero and why Bose has become more vocal in his support of it and is encouraging others to do so. Monero Talk starts now. But first, a special announcement. Tickets are now on sale for the first annual Monerotopia Confer and Chill event to be held in Miami on April 7th, next door to the Bitcoin 2022 conference. We already have some amazing speakers lined up and we'll be adding more in the coming weeks. Act fast to grab an early adopter ticket to secure your early adopter swag item and to get the best deal before we raise the ticket prices. Just go to Monerotopia.com where you can quickly purchase a ticket with crypto. Monero Talk really starts now. Bose, we're on. How are you, Douglas? How you doing, man? I'm doing excellent. Excellent. Thank it you so much. It depends on when you catch me. Sometimes I'm in a philosophical mindset. Sometimes I'm in a lawyering mindset. Sometimes I'm in a dad mindset. So... Oh. Okay, I'm looking for a little bit of everything on this show right now. I think uh, we'll cover all those bases. <laughs> okay. Well, I got I got a little tequila over here, so cheers. Cheers, my friend. So uh, I, I I wanted you to come on because I saw some interesting tweets you were putting out there. Uh, they were getting a lot of fanfare from the Monero community and. And yeah, I think it's fair to say you were using your your lawyer hat and your philosophical hat, not so much the dad hat. I didn't see those tweets, but uh, some really interesting insights into Monero. I just wanted to talk about them. You saw the dad tweet in my VMI, Virginia Military Institute tweet, where my son studies computer science. Oh, okay. I missed that one. Very cool. Very cool. Is he into Monero? He is into cryptocurrencies, but uh, he hasn't quite delved in as deeply as I would want him to. But you have to be gentle, Douglas. When you have children, you kind of slowly uh, make them do what you want them to do. It's their choice, after all. It's <laughs> their life. Yeah, I mean, I get the, obviously the best method, right, is to allow them to to find their own passions. Anytime you try to push them one way, I'm sure they they push back, right? Rebellion is a a very uh, parental thing that many parents learn about very late in the game, and usually it's not pretty. I have a seven year old, so I'm in the you know the honeymoon honeymoon phase. I mean, it's it's just it's beautiful with my seven year old girl. It's perfect everything's perfect. that is the age which is perfect because they cannot start thinking for themselves and tell you that you're absolutely 100 percent wrong <laughs> and she loves Monero. i don't i don't know how that happened just to shut me up she says she likes it congratulations on being a father douglas it's, Thank you, a, too. Uh, it's definitely uh the, it's definitely the best thing i got going uh nothing better is. than it Absolutely. So um, 
how did you get into Monero or crypto? We, we got to do the, the, the general crypto story here first. So if you want, if you don't mind. The fascination with my original fascination was with Bitcoin. And that was back in 2013 when I entered the space. And at that point, uh, there were just a handful of people talking about this new cryptocurrency and how um, it would be a means of uh, revamping uh, the economic system in this country. Uh, I've always been somewhat of a rebel at heart because by profession, I have come to distrust the government. And uh, Bitcoin at that juncture in 2013 was very much a vehicle for change as we knew it in the uh, holdings of people within a society. And so I, along with uh, several of my clients, uh, enjoyed becoming a part of the space. Now, that space started to change and evolve. And this is why you're seeing the tweets from my end coming out a little more uh, uh, higher in number because I see yet again another change occurring in what Bitcoin started out being and what it is today. And it's somewhat disheartening for me. Now it's been replaced with Monero, which I think is still has that rebellious streak to it. And as I have put out on tweets before, I think that Satoshi Nakamoto really did um, espouse the culture of Monero when he made Bitcoin. Uh, so that, there you have it. That's the, uh, the short story. All gets so similar uh, story as mine, uh, you know, in many ways. So, what do you see as the the purpose or the value proposition of crypto, or what you thought Bitcoin was or is supposed to be? Well, if you look at the the way that society functions today, you have the haves and the have-nots. We have premised an entire economic system on a fiat currency which debases over time. And in that environment, uh, all of the wealth is in the hands of just a few people. And the crumbs that are left over devalue at a rate in which the people really don't see what's happening, right? Uh, the people that do understand what's happening will leverage uh, their holdings within that fiat in systems that will have them accrue greater wealth over time. They have access to vehicles of wealth accumulation, which the normal human being, uh, the normal working class person doesn't. Uh, and you know, th that's uh, where we are as a society. And so you really play to the 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 digital gold side of it, or you're also interested in the, in the digital cash aspect of it? Well, the digital cash aspect of it is the lessening of friction within the systems of uh, interchange in an economic uh, system, right? Uh, that's the entire premise to what we're now talking about, the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies, we have brought this into the equation and are now debating the attributes of it as a means of lessening the friction that uh, supposedly currency uh, has. Uh, I think it's utter BS, but that's the, uh, the debate and the premise philosophically that the central banks are going to use on the topic. As far as digital gold is concerned, uh, I, I frankly like physical gold. What's wrong with physical? I never understood. Uh, physical is a wonderful thing. I touch it, I have it, I store it. Uh, nobody else knows 
where I have it, it's, it's a good thing. You can't obviously have a physical rendition of Bitcoin nor Monero by their very innate nature. Uh, although, Douglas, I remember still uh, those little physical Bitcoins, you remember? Yeah. That, yeah. They, uh, that they used to, to put out. I, sh I should have bought more of those uh, when I had the chance. I, I missed out on that opportunity. Yeah. But you know, there's something uh, very the tangible nature of something physical is 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 good. If we don't have that, then we look at the innate structure of what we're talking about. With uh, Bitcoin, you're not talking about a uh, currency that debases over time. With Monero, you're not talking about a currency that debases over time. And that's if you're looking at it as a uh, in the uh, mindset of it being a currency as opposed to the uh, a a, a a value proposition uh, for the uh, securing of wealth over time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, so where do you think oh, we, those open dimes too? By the way, you know those are. I think we're going to see more. I, I get what you're saying with the the, the physical versus the, but I think we are going to see more uh, implementations of it in the physical world beyond just the uh, uh, those coins that people collected, right? With the open dimes, that's that's a pretty interesting use case. It's kind of um, you know recreating uh, the physical dollar or you know gold backed dollar, uh, but with crypto. So hopefully we'll start to see more of that. But where do you think you saw Bitcoin go wrong then? What What is, you know, you, you said it, but uh, you alluded to it. But what exactly do you think the problem is? What, what happened? What went wrong? Uh, that is a, a uh, what went wrong is the mass commercialization of Bitcoin and um well, in, instead of me pausing so much, let me just come out and say it. Uh, Bitcoin was supposed to be a revolution. And when I start seeing signs of uh, Bitcoin revolution put up on Times Square, I know it's no longer a revolution. What it has become is a commercialization of a revolution in which the people are no longer really revolting at all because uh, they've been socially engineered by commercial interests that have entered the space. Uh, I called it in one of my tweets, uh, finance 2.0, right? Uh, what we wanted was for Bitcoin to change the way that finance was practiced. And what we are now getting is finance 2.0, in which n the players aren't changing. Uh, the billionaires are simply moving their monies into Bitcoin and becoming Bitcoin billionaires. What really has changed? And when I bring up this topic uh, in various forums, uh, lately I've been listening to some of the uh, the Bitcoin maxis uh, talking on spaces in Twitter. Uh, it's very interesting listening to them because uh, they truly do believe uh, that they are part of a revolution still. But I had the chance to chime in on my view that I just expressed to you, and it wasn't very well taken. <laughs> they, they didn't kick you out? They, they let you hang around a little bit? Normally they kick you right out. <laughs> <laughs> you have to speak in at least once or twice before they. I'm very uh, gentle in the way that I approach the issue. Plus, um, I, I don't like to. Uh, this is the this is the cop in me. I I, I don't like to um, express things that will hurt other people emotionally or uh, insult them in any way. I just put it out there. I said, listen, if we're talking about a revolution. Uh, we are not talking about billionaires remaining billionaires. When we're talking about billionaires remaining billionaires under the fiat system and now under the Bitcoin system, you're not talking about revolution anymore. You're simply talking about a transference of wealth based on technological advancement. That's it. 
we were supposed to be talking about the poor guy in Africa and no longer are we talking about the poor guy in Africa. We're talking about the rich guy on Wall Street who is the head of a hedge fund. We're talking about institutional money and we're talking about sovereign wealth funds entering the Bitcoin space. How yeah, are we not talking about the guy in Africa anymore? The reason is because Bitcoin is now commercialized. It is a commercial vehicle. So how would something like Monero avoid the same outcome? I don't think it will ever have the same outcome because Monero by its very nature of its privacy is far harder to control with very subtle movements into the ecosystem. It is very easy and it's already occurred where the government has very subtly moved into the ecosystem. Commercial interests have moved into the ecosystem. That is not possible with Monero very easily because at the heart of what Monero is, is exactly what is contrary to the interest of the institutional money. And that's privacy. We have in this country for, and now let me put on my lawyer hat for a moment, Douglas. We have in this country for the last 30 years or so, seen a degradation of fundamental rights. And it's occurring at a pace that normal people are just not seeing it. But there is something very wrong when the Supreme Court in this country puts out opinions uh, that are against the fundamental text of the first, fourth, fifth, ninth, fourteenth amendments, right? And that change it has occurred very subtly uh, and enough so that people don't really understand what's happening. What's really happening is that their rights are being degraded on the privacy front uh, and uh, on their self-sovereignty front. I mean, without privacy, how are you going to have self-sovereignty? 100%. I guess Bitcoiners would say, with regards to some of the other issues you were bringing up, um, that it's just going to be a transfer, a retransfer of wealth back to those who are already uh, wealthy. Uh, I guess is what they would say is, well, you know, it can't be inflated, so it can't be manipulated in the same way that the dollar currently is. So, yes, maybe the wealthy will have a greater advantage in terms of being able to obtain some to begin with, um, but ultimately they won't be able to hold on to it because of the nature of Bitcoin and. Their, their need to, to then spend it in, you know, in society and eventually it will, uh, you know, leach out to the, to the rest of, you know, to the rest of the world and they won't be able to corner it. But I guess the point you're trying to make is, yes, uh, something like that might be possible, but the fact that it's not private uh, then gives them an advantage to control it in other ways. So granted, they can't print more Bitcoin, um, but being more powerful than those that get into it later in the game, they're the ones that can, I guess, analyze the system better and use the lack of privacy to their own advantage. Without putting words, is that kind of what you're getting at as well? You, you hit the nail on the head, Douglas. Uh, and then you look at, uh, for instance, the conglomeration of mining interests within the United States currently, right? How... How is that in any way intelligence uh, at play? It's not. You, you, China bans the miners. The miners move their operations into the United States enough so that every federal court and every judge within that federal court system now has power over mining interests and that mining interests once it is accumulated to a 
certain high percentage, you have it open to attack. It's stupidity at play. What we wanted was for all of the miners across the world, even in nations that were against the mining interests under the table, and we would have true uh, decentral decentralization. What we're now having is centralization. And uh, that leaves the powers of uh, BlackRock uh, to put out little messages about ESG and what their interests uh, are at the time. And all of the CEOs of all of the major companies shake in their boots and they do what BlackRock wants them to do. And the Bitcoin price sinks down a little bit, comes back up, but sinks down a little bit. So decentralization was at the center. We no longer are moving in that in the right direction, even on the mining interests. Forget about the commercial interests. And as far as the uh, accumulation of wealth within the hands of the few, there was something uh, even today talking about how uh, the holdings of Bitcoin and Ethereum are within the same 1% of the people that are in that space, right? Uh, and, you know, so that's what I was talking about when we are discussing, you know, old finance really hasn't changed. It's all you know, finance 2.0. Got it, got it. Where, we're, we're covering broad, broad topics here, Douglas. But... Oh, this is, this is good stuff. I mean, I'm enjoying it. So I'm sure those listening will enjoy it as well. I have a million things I want to ask you, but I you know, don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> Where do you see, so you got involved, right? So you got more involved than you have been, it seems like. I think you were saying that as well. You you, you, you felt the need to get on Twitter and start talking about this more. Is that because you're concerned that something like Monero may not succeed if, if we don't continue to push it? Or do you see Monero, something like Monero being inevitable uh, despite what any of us do? It is inevitable as long as the traction uh, behind it can remain intact and as long as people keep talking about the issues that underlie the importance of Monero and the distinguishing factors between it and uh, the other cryptocurrencies, right? Uh, so uh, the discussions uh, continue to uh, uh, to uh, happen online. Uh, people that never thought of Monero before, never understood what it was about, learned something more about it. And uh, thanks to the people that sponsor Monero Talk and uh, especially uh, Vic. Vic is, is wonderful people. Uh, he has in his heart an understanding of the reason that you need a Monero, right? Not all people understand the need for Monero. They're just looking for the price action of the coin and uh, disheartened by the fact that it isn't $60,000 per unit. Uh, that isn't the point. It will get to higher levels. The issue is to continue the traction and to continue the effort to make the public understand uh, what's happening, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That that's you know that's why I was excited when I saw you starting to tweet because you're you know just a, a new face and I'm seeing new faces pop up all the time. You know, obviously you've been around in the background for a long time, but you're you a new face now in Monero, and that's nice to see. And we're always now we're, we're seeing them all the time. And it's growing. Why why though aren't we even seeing more though of these type of people that should understand the value of digital cash, right? So these, you know, people that, you know, lawyers, right? People that are are Americans, people that are patriots, people that, you know, understand what the value of liberty is and the fact that it may be uh 
threatened now more than ever, given the direction of humanity with technology and technology colluding with governments, essentially. Um, understanding that there is this need, right? This need for something like Monero. Everybody seems to be aware of the problem, right? They're aware of surveillance capitalism and things like that. Uh, but why aren't we seeing more people become aware of the solution Monero? Is it because they are blinded by Bitcoin or is it other things? What do you well, think? Well, you still have the gold guys uh, that are pushing uh, gold. And I'm not saying that they are, are wrong in any way. I, I'm just saying that uh, society is going through a change. You're seeing revolutions uh, that are occurring uh, subtly. Uh, you're seeing cities ablaze. You're seeing people that really don't understand why it is that they're angry. Uh, but the reason that they're angry is because they've been economically deprived. Uh, and the liberty movement is uh, coming alive. The patriot movement that you spoke about has been uh, kindled uh, within the past two years. Uh, it was really kindled six years ago, but uh, it's being rekindled because now you have oppressive forces that are occurring uh, at a greater pace, right? Uh, we have subtle movements in this country to take away our liberties, to take away our Fourth Amendment rights, to take away parental uh, units' rights of even educating their own children. Uh, and in on, on top of that, you have disenfranchisement based on a fiat system uh, that was uh, never a normal person's everyday guy's friend to begin with, right? So how can we help the Monero cause? Uh, you would simply uh, propel Monero within the groups that are the patriots to educate them as to how the liberty movement that they are a part of, the patriot movement that they are a part of, can benefit from the likes of Monero. Because whereas Monero is the revolution on the monetary front, those patriots are fighting on Second Amendment issues, they're fighting on issues that are at the heart of the Bill of Rights. You know, I call it the war against the Bill of Rights. It's what I talked about earlier. The Supreme Court has been whittling away in this country uh, at our Bill of Rights, all of the amendments uh, for as long as I've been practicing law. So is there a, a nexus of, of interests that can uh, be harnessed between the, the patriots of this country the uh, revolutionaries in the Monero space? Absolutely. So you going out to some of the, uh, the Second Amendment uh, uh, pr protests and the Second Amendment crowd uh, would go a, little, a long way, I think. Uh, and I think that uh, they would uh, uh, be interested. Definitely, definitely. Guns and Bitcoin just recently added Monero as a pay. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Guns and Bitcoin. Uh, so that sends a strong message, right? They recently added Monero as a payment option. Um, I ran for Congress. I don't know if you know that. And mm -hmm. uh, it was obviously a big part of why it was literally the reason why I ran, right? So I, I wanted to be there, you know, on the floor if we got to this point where this debate was being had and somebody needed to step up and, and protect Monero, right? Um, but I was surprised by the amount of people that didn't really understand why I cared so much about it, you know? So uh, obviously I understand from the where I ran, I'm dealing, I, people are more concerned about local issues, but just overall, I, I, would, I expected a little bit more, um, I don't know, feedback and, and, and people reaching out that supposedly believe in these concepts uh, aligning with them. And I was surprised to see that not happen. Uh, that's why I mentioned Bitcoin is potentially being part of the problem here in preventing that, right? Because you have guys like Alex Gladstein, are you familiar with him, of the Human Rights Foundation? 
with the Human Rights Foundation, and they have yet to add Monero as an option to donate. Um, and so there's these a lot of these guys like him and others that are out there talking about all these ideas that we're talking about, but refusing to use the word Monero or associate with Monero. And that that frustrates me more than anything else. Uh, and I see that as part of the problem, but I don't really know what you do there. I think that the, well, this is one thing that, did you see what I put out as a tweet a, 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 a bit earlier? It was a, uh, it was a uh, video that I put out. And, and what I said in the video is, stop focusing on the use of Monero within illicit issues within society. It's the wrong way to go. Uh, Monero stands for privacy. Privacy is at the heart of this country. The forefathers of this country believed in self-sovereignty. They believed in privacy. They wrote about privacy and cared about it enough to give us the Bill of Rights. Somehow, we have taken the word privacy and put innuendo of illegal, illicit activity, and some in the Monero community will push that aspect of Monero and its use on black markets and dark centers of the web in order to propel its usage and its use case. Monero's use case is not on the uh, 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 the uh, Silk Roads of the world. Monero's use is as a vehicle to fight against the very essence of why people remain poor, and that is lack of financial privacy and a premise on a fiat system that debases the currency over time, right? So when I am talking to one of my clients, as I have throughout the years, on where they should place their monies within an estate plan, for instance, I say, put your monies into things that will not devalue over time. And one of them is Monero. And it's not that they will use Monero to buy drugs on uh, the you know, epicenters of uh, where you go with Tor. It's that they're going to hold on to a cryptocurrency that believes in privacy as its fundamental basis. And frankly, privacy is a legitimate uh, claim and a legitimate right that we have as human beings in this country. People like the what you just alluded to, uh, commercial interests, and every humanitarian organization, every NGO, is worried about the optics of everything that they do. Because they don't want, as you and I both know, they do not want the powers of the government to question them. They don't want visits uh, from various regulatory or law enforcement officials to scrutinize what is happening within uh, their entity. And they believe that if they utter the word Monero, that they will be associated with illicit activity. And that is really a fundamental flaw in the way that uh, perhaps we have pushed Monero over the years. Uh, and uh, the more people that have legitimate business interests that understand the uh, legitimate uh, use cases for a coin that is privacy centric uh, can help that effort along. Uh, there is nobody that's going to say that attorney Bose went on the dark web to purchase LSD or a fake ID. That's not what's happening. Uh, so if people like me get involved in the space and legitimate uh, effort is put forth to market the coin properly, I think that traction will build and it will not be a taboo 
uh, word uh, to put out on, on various people's uh, uh, websites as a form of payment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty as being one of those people that points out the fact that it's overwhelmingly used on the dark markets uh, only because I think that's the best indication of the fact that it actually works as intended. Um, you know, if if it works there for those purposes, that means it's going to work for all the positive use cases that we hope Monero to be used for. And it's the best litmus test for it right now. There's really nothing else that's other way to test whether or not uh, digital cash is working right now um, in a very uh, measurable way, right? That's a slippery slope, Douglas, because uh, if that connection is not made uh, properly, uh, then you end up with people not wanting to have touch uh, nor learn about Monero, right? So, you know. I agree, I agree, but... Um... Yeah, I'll leave that up to others to to figure out how to market it around that. But uh, I can't help but just speak the truth all the time. So, uh, and it, you know, and also, I'm not necessarily opposed to open marketplaces. Uh, I I want us to to continue to trend towards that and have the internet be a facilitator of that and technologies like Monero allowing for the free flow of uh, you know products in 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 return for value. Uh, obviously, it's unfortunate that illegal activity takes place in, the, in these areas as well. But I mean, you're, you used to be a cop and now you're an attorney, but uh, my hope, and we, we talked about you know the constitution, um, really at the end of the day, it should come down to good old fashioned police work for, for solving those things, right? And we should never, we shouldn't be concerned about the tool that's used when it's a tool that also provides so much good in terms of uh, allowing people to participate in society in a liberty preserving way. Cash is used uh, on uh, to purchase drugs. It's a bad thing and we need to get rid of it, right? Is that not the premise to the entire movement for a cashless society, Douglas? Exactly. Cash is uh, the the tool that is used uh, to purchase uh, illegal things, right? It's the you know it, society is optics. That's basically what it is. Everything comes down to optics, and the government plays mind games on the citizenry and the citizenry focuses on things sometimes mindlessly through and you can't you can't help it because the media makes it so that uh, you are bombarded with messages uh, how many times within the past year have you seen a news story about cash is needs to be uh, uh, set aside and we need to move to a cashless society because it's used for drugs, right? You, you, you've seen that as a highlight in media stories all the time. Who's pushing that? Who's pushing that particular optic? Well, who's pushing that particular optic are the governmental interests that want us to be a cashless society so that they can take away the last facet of self-sovereignty that a human being has, which is you know, being able to touch and feel uh, their cash. You can't really trace cash, so it gives you a sense of, of privacy, and there is obviously some, some privacy that's attached to it. Let's take that away, Douglas. Let's make it so that CBDCs are the way to go, so that governmental interests, should you not do what the government asks you to do, we can turn off at the touch of a switch all of your accounts, right? We've got a law enforcement community, and this is where I kind of uh, get upset with my brothers in blue, uh, because uh, they too are to blame uh, for this movement that we're seeing now against the police in this country. We brought it upon ourselves. We, we, we are to blame. Uh, we uh, went out on the streets and we used a little bit of uh, uh, force where it didn't belong. We made decisions and pushed 
uh, where uh, we shouldn't have. We uh, planted evidence where we should not have planted evidence. Uh, and we thought that we were taking this Machiavellian uh, approach to making society a better place. And what you get out of that is a revolution in which uh, people start shooting us in the head as we sit in our patrol cars, right? Uh, the recent story about the FBI going into the Beverly Hills safe deposit boxes. You brought an indictment against the vault owner. Why the hell did you open up all of the safety deposit boxes that are in question? What is the nexus between the safety deposit boxes and its contents and the owner of the establishment. Did you, when you were swearing out your affidavit, have probable cause to believe that the owner, and many of the people don't know what the heck I'm talking about right now, Douglas. So let I, me get- I totally do. So they probably do, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised, the Monero <laughs> community probably does. What, what in the hell is the nexus between all of these almost 400 separate safety deposit boxes and the entity of private vaults as a company. Did you have any connection in opening up the, pro the safety deposit boxes for all of these citizens? No, you did not. You got a warrant based on an indictment against the organization, the corporate interest that owned these safety deposit boxes. Good cops would have thought to themselves, you know what, now I need the connection. So I need to be able to tell this magistrate that the owners of the entity went into the establishment and they used box numbers 125, 126, and 127. Now you've got probable cause on 125, 126, and 127 because there is a nexus in the illegal activity that you suspect and particularized boxes where you think that those illicit gains are being held. No, that's not what you did, FBI. What you did was you brought an indictment in federal court against the organization, and then you trampled upon the Fourth Amendment rights of all of the people that had assets within that vault itself. You opened up all of their safety deposit boxes. You seized without warrant all of their items. And then you brought the burden back on them to prove that they got what was in those safety deposit boxes through legitimate means. That is not the test. That is not the Fourth Amendment. That is not good uh, uh, law enforcement. That is not anything other than the trampling of the Fourth Amendment. And what that leads to, when you take Machiavellian steps like that, what that leads to is a greater distrust of law enforcement, which comes back to haunt us out on the streets as my friends are still patrolling in PG County, Maryland, or in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I used to patrol. So these uh, steps that are being taken uh, are being taken in order to achieve what these people believe is for the betterment of society. However, actions speak louder than words. When you trample on people's rights, people rebel. And therefore, you see cities burning, you see commercial uh, buildings that are being burned to the ground. You, that's anger. And that anger is premised on the actions that we have taken as a society, and particularly government has taken. So everything has a cause and effect, and people need to understand that and take their steps a little bit more uh, carefully 
uh, because they really do have uh, ramifications. When we spoke earlier about the, the uh, liberty movement, the patriots in this country, uh, they are uh, steaming from January 6th. They're steaming from January 6th because you took a, perhaps it wasn't a peaceful protest, but it certainly wasn't a goddamn coup attempt. You're telling me that the alt-right entered Capitol Hill in order to effectuate a coup and not a single one of them had a firearm on them? Are you out of your mind? Because it's an absolute fiction, yet you put the power of the FBI in full. Every single field agent in Northern Virginia was working on the January 6th incident in order to rile up all of these alt-right people, right? And what does that end up with? It ends up with a judge that is presiding in the criminal court, federal in DC, saying FBI and prosecutors, this is schizophrenic. For a judge to use the word schizophrenic and lodge that word against law enforcement government interests shows you just how awry government and law enforcement interests have taken things. Everybody that's a part of the investigation and the prosecution within the January 6th incident understands that it's a farce. And when you take those steps and prosecute for the optics that you're trying to achieve on the political front, because that's what it was, it was optics to push on the political front you get a blowback. And that blowback first comes from the judge who sees what's happening right before her. It comes from the people that are affected. And what you garner is increased distrust for government and increased distrust for LEOs. So I'm somewhat disheartened by my brothers in blue and uh, most of them know why. Integrity is fundamental to law enforcement. It is fundamental to law enforcement. And once you lose that essence of integrity, uh, you lose the game in full. So, so many things you, you mentioned there that I, I would like to respond or comment on. Uh, but I guess the most important of all would be, what does this mean for Monero, what's your thinking there, right? Is it is Monero is it is it going to come down to a Supreme Court case at some point? Whether or not you know Monero is is free speech money, whether or not the code is protected, uh, you know you you can't ban Monero, you can't stop developers from uh, software developers from producing open source code that people then use to transact value. Um, do you think it's we're going to get to that point? And ultimately, if we did, Monero will survive in the United States? Or you think, we, no worries, we're not going to ever approach that anyway. Nobody's going to actually ever try to ban Monero in any way in the United States. I don't think they need to. Uh, I, I don't think they need to ban Monero. When the government uh, openly utters uh, the word Monero, uh, they will have an effect that they didn't anticipate, right? Stride down effect. <laughs> so they're not going to do it that way. What they are going to do is uh, to uh, put uh, this uh, label on it, this uh, panache, um, uh, this uh, uh, taint on the concept of a privacy coin, whether it be Monero or many of the other privacy coins that come in and out of the, um, the space. Um, and uh, they're going to uh, not uh, propel that. But paralleling that effort uh, is the issue of these wonderful gains that can be had by having uh, the most fundamentally open coin, uh, which is Bitcoin, right? Uh, it, it worries me, Douglas, when 
uh, the government stops being against something because there's always an underlying reason of why they have stopped being against it. And it's not because we have won, right? <laughs> it's not because exactly. of that. So, so this is so true. I mean, that, that's exactly what I think when I see it. Once again, which is why I ran for Congress, right? Because when, when you've seen it brought up in the past and now it's commonplace, um, you know, when it, when it was a little less understood and when Bitcoin was the tool that was used in the dark markets before Monero, the response ultimately always was, well, don't worry about it because Bitcoin is actually completely transparent. And then it was, oh, really? Like yeah, you could you could even uh, fight crime better than you already are able to. Oh okay, so I guess we got nothing to worry about. Um, but with Monero, that that's that's not the case. So your thinking is what though? But that they're not going to try to uh, put regulations or bans in place, but rather they're just going to talk about what the the uh, negative use cases are and let you know, hope that society decides not to touch it because of that? Uh, I think that the, uh, well, yes, because, uh, and then, and, and well, let's take a step back for a moment uh, about the, the uh, prevalence of uh, BTC within uh, the marketplace. The, the ETFs, for instance, uh, that, uh, the uh, commercial interests have applied for. Uh, BTC ETFs are the uh, complete antithesis, as we've already touched upon, the philosophy that Bitcoin was premised on. If you had told me, Douglas, back in 2013, that uh, th what we are uh, doing is uh, ultimately we're going to put out an ETF for of uh, Bitcoin, I wouldn't have propelled any of my clients uh, to have any interest in it because I had the option back in 2013 uh, on Wall Street normal financial vehicles, right? I can put any of my clients and their estate plans into any stock that I desire through our financial planners. I didn't do that for a reason, right? Yet we are where we are. Uh, but as, as far as, uh, you're, you're very centric, uh, to Monero. I, um, and that absolutely is fine. Uh, because frankly, it is the king of the, uh, the, uh, the space. Uh, but where do I think that, uh, Monero is headed? Uh, I think it is headed for the exact growth that Bitcoin would have had, had it not been for the commercial interests coming into the space and had it not had the help of the US government stopping its discussions on the illicit activities that Bitcoin is used for uh, when they realized that CypherTrace uh, basically could do what they needed to do, right? And uh, just think for a moment back in history, when was it that government stopped talking about Bitcoin being uh, a vehicle for terrorism, and uh, terrorist financing and money laundering, tax evasion, and all of these things. It just happened to coincide with when CypherTrace as a commercial entity came about and when the government realized, hey, wait a second, this Bitcoin thing, we kind of like it. We like it for two reasons. Number one, all these transactions, it's open. And there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. My God, this is a wonderful thing. We're not gonna, we're gonna stop talking about Bitcoin being a bad thing. And we're going to allow Bitcoin to 
pervade into the depths of society. And we're going to slowly bring out the ETFs, right? It's, it's classic uh, piecemeal social engineering. Uh, and uh, that, you know, that's a concept that we can yeah, talk the, about. The it, other thing is the, um, not to interrupt there, but uh, you're making some good points, is the unrealized capital gains tax, which, you know, maybe that never happens, but, you know, it's, it's got pretty seriously discussed recently. And if something like that were to happen, then that really closes the loop for them, right? Because... Sure. Then they can continue to to money print, and the money gets pushed into Bitcoin because it's the safe haven asset, mm -hmm. and then they go and collect their chunk of of taxes from those unrealized capital gains, and they can keep repeat the process. It's like they reinvented the printing uh, uh, of the dollar at that point, uh, which I think is almost a it's it's why wouldn't it head in that direction, unfortunately. In one of my tweets, I put out, um, you know, w when you want to um, infiltrate a movement, you cannot take bold steps, right? Uh, you have to take uh, very small baby steps. Uh, and the government has been taking very small baby steps for the past uh, about three years now. Uh, and uh, before you know it, uh, we may truly have the uh, unrealized capital gains issue uh, coming into fruition. And the vehicle will be there uh, on a transparent ledger that nobody will be able to do anything about. Uh, and uh, they're going to be caught up and uh, they're going to think to themselves, perhaps we should have done things a bit more prudently. It's wild. It's wild. And by the way, Douglas, uh, one point so I can get this across to uh, the Monero community knows this, but perhaps others uh, that are uh, just doing their, their homework on Monero will realize the, the Fourth Amendment is premised on the reasonable expectation right. of privacy. Right. That was the next question I was going to ask you, but go right. ahead. Keep, keep so running. The, it's the reasonable expectation of privacy. So the premise of the Fourth Amendment is based on this uh, 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 case from the 1960s that has not kept up with technology. It's the Katz case. And we uh, review whether a person a person's Fourth Amendment has been infringed based on a two-part question. Uh, the first part is whether the government's action uh, infringed on the uh, person's, uh, what the defendant uh, thought would uh, be a private uh, space. And let me get the, the words right. All right. So my paralegal has put this together. Did the government action invade a place that the defendant expected to be private? The second part of the question is the expectation of privacy. Was it reasonable? Well, it's known from the get go that Bitcoin is premised on a public ledger. There is no expectation of privacy and it certainly cannot be reasonable. If the entire premise of Bitcoin is that it is based on a public ledger, I repeat, there is no way that you can have a privacy interest in that item. I'm so glad and you're there, talking about this. I've, I've been thinking about I mean, it for quite some time, and it, it's such an important point. Uh, go ahead, continue. Is that, so, I mean... You know, perhaps the 1960s case of cats will be revamped. It needs to be uh, because there have been so many abuses uh, to it. Um, and like we said, and there has been an ongoing theme of our conversation, the Fourth Amendment is eroding bet before our eyes. Uh, and the federal judges, uh, uh, particularly the Seventh Circuit, has been allowing it to happen left and right. Uh, I don't know what it is, Douglas. We used to have judges like Scalia uh, that actually <laughs> would be bold 
and take steps uh, to protect uh, the uh, Bill of Rights, but um, uh, no longer, perhaps with the new set of judges on the uh, bench of the Supreme Court, we'll have a, a shift uh, both to 4A as well as 2A. But uh, from what I can see in the in the district courts, uh, the judges don't have a backbone. Uh, it's as if uh, the interests of LEOs uh, to trample the Fourth Amendment rights that we spoke about and taking a Machiavellian view to things as we also spoke about, uh, is uh, you know uh, the uh, the way that uh, things are going. But um, the point that I wanted to make is, uh, people, if you think that uh, fundamentally uh, you have a privacy interest in the holdings of Bitcoin, you don't. Now, a theoretical attorney will say, Bose, you're wrong because uh, you are not distinguishing the fact that it's the holding of BTC as opposed to the transactions. A person may not have a privacy interest in the transactions on a public ledger, but certainly that's distinguishable from the holdings of BTC that they may have in their samurai wallet on their Android phone. And I'm saying to those attorneys, you are living on a dreamland because the argument of Bitcoin's transactions not having any privacy embedded in them and therefore not having Fourth Amendment protections will certainly have a very small step to the holdings that one has in that particular cryptocurrency. And if you think theoretical attorneys, academic attorneys in this world and professors, particularly the professors, my God, if you think that that academic argument is going to work in real life, you are mistaken. And the crux of cases that are the Fourth Amendment cases give rise to that. Why take the risk? Why not put the uh, and transact in a methodology and in a vehicle that provides you privacy at the heart and core of the infrastructure that gave rise to that particular coin? Uh, it just baffles the mind. So interesting. Uh, so the Bank Secrecy Act comes to mind when we talk about this, and the third party doctrine is what it basically uh, allows the Bank Secrecy Act to exist. And it's this idea that there's no expectation of privacy when you're using the banking system, which is a third party. So you sh so you know that the bank knows your information, you know they know how much you have in your bank account and they know what your transactions are. So there should be no expectation that uh, that information wouldn't be known by others, right? That it's private. And basically that equally applies to Bitcoin. And I think one of the arguments against it would be to, you know, a, you know, for the fact that obviously you shouldn't have uh, an expectation of privacy when using Bitcoin is the fact that other things like Monero exist for the purposes of overcoming that flaw and providing privacy. So uh, everybody knows or should know that if you're using Bitcoin, you should have no expectation of privacy. And it's very interesting how that's going to play out because uh, I guess essentially governments could track and trace it without having to worry about violating the fourth amendment but with monero potentially they would right because we always talk about monero obviously the goal with monero is um and to our understanding it's fulfilling that goal that nobody can track and trace it uh but the expectation of privacy is that no that you know uh that nobody is seeing your transactions or how much you have so if governments go uh, over and above to try to break it and track and trace it, is that potentially a violation of your, you know, Fourth Amendment rights? And you're going one step further than I did, but that certainly would be the argument, right? Yeah. But you don't even have that argument if the premise of the uh, the interest that you have started out with no reasonable expectation of privacy. 
right? It is it is my job as a criminal defense attorney that that is now entering the the crypto space and advising these these people that are interested in the space uh, what to anticipate. And the lens that I'm using is premised on me being a businessman. It's premised on me being a law enforcement officer. It's premised on me understanding criminal law, and it's premised on me understanding how government works, right? You running for Congress, you have a very uh, deep understanding of how politics works and how important, how important the optics are and how truly crooked politics is in the United States. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that understanding is not had by all. And, uh, you know, that's what we're doing in this conversation. I, I also work for, for local municipal government. So I, I know it, at, at all levels, and it's, it's the same thing on all levels. And I've, I've seen it firsthand. So listen, Bose, this has been an amazing conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. This, is, uh, this has been great. We haven't touched upon as much as I would have liked to have touched upon, Douglas, but you can talk about this topic forever and, uh, you know, not, not uh, scratch the surface, right? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we could do more shows, uh, but if there, is there anything else you want to bring up now? Is there anything, any other topics you want to make sure we touch upon? You know, the, uh, there is uh, tonight, uh, there's going to be a um, uh, Twitter space that will be talking about the distinction between Bitcoin and Monero. Uh, I would love it if we had uh, a greater number of people using the Twitter spaces to uh, propel the conversation. Uh, because, Douglas, it is really time for us as citizens of the United States uh, to start talking, keyboarding, writing, and fundamentally supporting through our wallets causes of liberty. Monero is only one facet of that movement of liberty. What I see around me is the government forces as well as their uh, what I call their, their strong arm, which is our my LEO community, uh, using their power truly to disparage the populace. We're not going to take it. We need to fundamentally understand the Bill of Rights. We need to read the Bill of Rights. We need to understand what our inherent rights are as human beings and as citizens of the United States. I don't like it when I see crypto uh, uh, community persons talking about leaving the United States, becoming expats in places like Portugal. Uh, and I don't think that that is the right path uh, for the country nor its citizenry. We as a nation were premised on fundamental beliefs. It is time for us to start talking back and standing up for those beliefs. The Fourth Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. If anybody in the crowd does not and has not read those amendments, please do, because that is what makes you sovereign. Your currency that you are holding stands for the proposition of your self-sovereignty. It is not an issue of how much gain you have in the past year. It's not about how much money that you're making in the ups and downs of the marketplace. We're seeing right before our eyes ridiculous coins that are coming out through the monies that were made in Bitcoin and Ethereum propelling Shiba Inu dog tokens of the world. Well, what is that? That's nothing other than the promulgation of the old wealth from the whales entering new spaces, waiting for the rise to occur, skimming off the top, 
and then watching the coin plummet to the behest of all of those unsophisticated people that were a part of that mania, right? That's not what this movement is premised upon. This movement is premised upon fighting for the rights that were the fundamental issues that were brought up and given to us by the forefathers of this country. It's time for the United States citizenry to really speak back. And I am not talking about throwing a Molotov cocktail uh, into the federal court building. I am talking about putting our money where our putting our money where our beliefs are, which is to support candidates that stand for liberty, support the candidates that stand for the uh, the wealth and something other than a debasing currency. Uh, Ron Paul is an absolute hero. He got crushed, right? Uh, and because not enough money went his way. Uh, that can't happen. And that movement has got to occur quickly because on the other side, the movement against the citizenry is building up steam rather quickly. And it's coming from all fronts. It's coming from the economic front, it's coming from the social front, and it's coming from the legal front. Those. Great job, man. Great job. You got me excited. Yeah, you you speak very, very eloquently about these topics. And uh, I, li I like your your spin on it. You know, you have you have a, a unique angle on it as well. Um, and obviously, you know, the law very well. So uh, it's interesting to hear, hear the hear the points you have to make. Uh, any chance we can see you down in Miami for Monerotopia? Have you have you heard about Monerotopia? Of course, I've heard about Monerotopia, Douglas. I, I listen to all of the podcasts that Monero Talk has. Uh, yes, I will do my best to get down there. I may not attend the 35,000 member BTC conference. Uh, I don't like uh, very large crowds, uh, but I will make it a point to go so, to something a bit more intimate where uh, perhaps we can talk about the uh, the movement for true liberty in this country. Amazing, man! I can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, what what is this Twitter Spaces that you mentioned? I didn't even see that. There's one happening tonight. Who's who's running it? Yes, there is one happening tonight. What I will do, Douglas, is I will right now retweet uh, that space um, uh, and. Let's keep the conversation going. I will try to join you. I got my. I gotta entertain the daughter a little bit, but we'll definitely try to jump in on that. That's great that you're doing that, man. It's it's great that you're being more vocal on Twitter. Um, and do we have a choice, Douglas? Keep, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, really, do we have a choice as fathers? Okay, I have three. I want to leave this earth with these children having some semblance of freedom. I mean, true freedom. And I will fight till the bitter end to make that happen. That's my duty as a father. Cheers to that, sir. Yeah, there's, there's nothing better uh, than that that we could pass on, right? As, as our legacy or our hope to, that our children to, to inherit is a world more liberated than the one that we, than we live in. I think that's a great way to end it. Is it, where can people follow you, uh, find you, please, you know, s s let the people know. Uh, the Twitter is where I've been putting out most of my thoughts. It, I am now becoming a bit more vocal in, uh, what I believe in. Uh, that's the ampersand sign, uh, lawyer bitcoiner um or douglas is it uh bitcoiner lawyer uh, let me see <laughs> i'm not sure <laughs> get it right i think that it's lawyer bitcoiner uh but i should be easy enough okay uh, find to find i'm not the uh, best person at uh 
plugging any commercial interest, Douglas, forgive me. It's it, yep. Lawyer Bitcoiner. Yep. Thank you. So definitely give him a follow guys. He's, uh, been saying a lot of unique, encouraging things that, uh, hopefully most of you listening will, will agree with and pass on on Twitter. Bose, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Again. I appreciate you. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guest, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.